This is Because I Said So, Parenting Advice, with love and leadership from the nation's leading parenting expert, John Roseman, syndicated columnist, author, conference speaker, and the only psychologist to point out that psychology has caused more problems than it has solved, from American Family Radio, here's your host, John Roseman. Hello out there in AFR Radio Land, and welcome to another exciting episode of Because I Said So with your host, John Roseman. I'm all about parenting, and I hope you can stay with us for the next half hour. I finished up last Saturday's show with a testimonial from a mother whom I did not identify, who was telling me that she started out her mothering career with a boy who by the age of three was completely out of control and that it was at that point in her parenthood that she learned from her husband's superior officer in the Navy about me and my work. And she started reading my books and getting a hold of everything I had written as much of what I had written as she possibly could and took some drastic steps that I talk about in my book, uh, The Well-Behaved Child. And within a very short period of time, her son was completely under control and uh, went to kindergarten. And uh, his teachers praised him as being well-behaved, well-mannered, obedient, respectful, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And she went on to have seven kids. And she ended her letter by saying, thank you, John Rosemond. It's all because of you. And I really, really, I mean, I can't tell you how much that letter warmed my heart. It's what I live for is hearing people say that uh, my ministry to America's parents has changed their lives. But in all honesty, I don't take credit for the advice that I give people. All I'm doing is using two sources. First of all, I am using the principles that governed the raising of children 60 plus years ago. I sometimes humorously say I'm channeling for my great grandmother. And secondly, I use God's word. And so I use two sources outside myself, which is why I call myself the great parenting plagiarist, because I don't have any new ideas. I believe God has given me a gift of discernment and understanding where child rearing is concerned. I believe that he has, along with this gift, given me an assignment and a ministry. And uh, that's my view on what I do, is this is an assignment, it is a ministry, it is a gift, and I'm not making up new ideas. Uh, This is what the mental health professions now see. And I am a psychologist. I'm and and I tell every uh, every audience I speak to, whether on the radio or or elsewhere in America, this I am a psychologist. I happen to hold a license to practice psychology issued by the duly appointed North Carolina Psychology Board. They regret the day they ever gave me a license because I absolutely know, it's not my opinion, that psychology has caused most of the problems that we are currently dealing with in American parenting, which, by the way, parents did not deal with before we started listening to psychologists and mental health professionals in general tell us how to raise kids. When we were still listening to our children's grandparents and great-grandparents and other elders in our churches and communities advise us on the raising of children. When a stable parenting paradigm was handed down from generation to generation intact during each transfer, and when the receiving generation revered the way they themselves had been raised, we were raising children well. And then we started listening to the progressive postmodern voice of psychology America, and everything went to Hades in a straw basket. And so that, you know, that's my mission is to restore 
traditional biblically based parenting to America. So I was uh, presenting at Trinity Free Will Baptist Church in Greenville, North Carolina. Wonderful group of people. Pastor Ken, his wife Jane, uh, just everybody there was just uh, friendly and embracing. And I presented on Friday night. I was a one-man family conference for three days. (laughs) I presented on Friday night following dinner. I presented on Saturday morning for two and a half hours following breakfast. And I presented on Sunday morning. I did Sunday school, and then I did the sermon. And then on Sunday afternoon, I did two hours of presentation to wrap it all up. And a couple introduced themselves to me the first night, Friday night, and they told me they had driven from Richmond, Virginia to hear me talk. Now, Richmond, Virginia is three to three and a half hours, depending on the weight of your right foot, from Greenville. And so these folks drove, let's call it three and a half hours to Greenville to hear me talk. And I said, well, you know, why'd you do that? Uh, Not a challenging question, but just seeking information. And they had heard me last fall at a school in Richmond and where I had spoken for only 90 minutes. And they said that the 90 minutes they spent listening to me in Richmond in the fall had completely transformed their parenting. That they had gone home and within a week had transformed their three-year-old child from a disobedient, wild, tantruming, to an obedient, calm, relaxed child. And uh, they said th- they they couldn't believe it. And they figured that if 90 minutes of listening to me could produce that, that six or seven hours of listening to me would uh, have to produce a whole lot more. And they gave up, uh, they, they stood up and they gave their testimony to the entire group at my request. And only because I wanted people to understand, to see firsthand, look, this stuff works. Here are people who are testifying to the fact that it works. They're ordinary, average people. They're not exceptional people in any respect. And you can do this too. And uh, But again, I was very careful to point out to the audience, look, I take no credit for this whatsoever. Uh, All I'm doing is following God's instructions and passing them along and channeling for my great-grandmother and passing that wisdom along. And, of course, you know, my great-grandmother uh, was—her parenting book was the Bible. And so there's really no difference, actually. But that's what I'm doing. So people give me the credit, but the credit is really not due to me— personally, in the final analysis. I've been given a gift to discern, to understand, to communicate with America's parents, and uh, but it's but the, the stuff I'm talking about, it all comes from the highest authority, let me assure you. So I uh, recently began writing a book. Uh, maybe it's going to be a website-based, video-based parenting program, and I'm I'm developing it. I'm in the process of developing it. And when I develop something like this, I develop it in front of audiences. And the title of this is The Ten Biggest Mistakes That Parents Make and How to Stop Making Them. And for anybody out there who's writing it down real quickly, um, I've already copyrighted and trademarked that title. So don't uh, try any funny stuff. But uh, anyway, the 10 biggest mistakes parents make and how to stop making them. And the first biggest mistake that parents make is listening to the experts and believing that they know what they're talking about. And since I talk about that every week on the show, I will just be very brief about talking about that. But what I'm going to do over the next few shows is go through some of those mistakes, one at a time, a segment at a time on this program, and hopefully communicate to 
you, my radio audience, what you need in order to bring about in your homes what uh, the two parents that I've been talking about up till this point in time, the two sets of parents brought about in their homes within a relatively short period of time. Transforming out-of-control children into respectful, obedient, and focused kids. So anyway, the first of the 10 biggest mistakes, again, that parents make is believing the experts, believing the people with capital letters after their names simply by virtue of their capital letters and their impressive credentials know what they're talking about. And this has been a major theme of this show, that we have been hoodwinked in American parenting by the mental health professional community who made up, invented, snatched out of thin air a new way to raise children because these are progressives who believe in new things, you know. And a new way to raise children in the 1960s marketed it very skillfully and effectively to the American parent. And things have been going downhill from there. I have given that a lot of attention, so I'm not going to give it a lot of attention on this show, only to remind everyone that no piece of psychological theory that constitutes what I call postmodern psychological parenting has ever been proven, and most of it's been disproven. For example, high self-esteem, the research finds, is highly associated with antisocial behavior. The research has failed to confirm that behavior modification, the manipulation of reward and punishment to bring about changes in human behavior, No one has ever proven that uh, behavior modification works on humans. And everything, and I mean everything Freud ever said, has been disproven. So um, with that, we're going to take a break. The show is called Because I Said So. I'm John Rosemond, your host. You can find out more about me by going to my website at johnrosemond.com. And uh, I'm on American Family Radio every Saturday, 5 o'clock Central Time, 6 o'clock Eastern. All right, well, glad you could stay with us. And what I've started doing with this program and this particular program is I have started going through a new parenting presentation that I have developed, or I'm in the process really of developing, but I never really stop being in the process of working on something. It is called The 10 Biggest Mistakes Parents Make and How to Stop Making Them. And the way that I have organized the material is to associate each of the 10 biggest mistakes that parents make with a common parental complaint. The first of the 10 is, in other words, this is the mistake, is believing the experts. And the parental complaint that is associated with believing the experts is John The raising of children is highly confusing, anxiety arousing, guilt producing, etc., etc. And the principle here is that the more, and this is a very ironic thing for me to say because I've written, depending on how you count them, I've written between 15 and 20 parenting books, uh, books on child rearing and other family issues. But I maintain this that if you read secular parenting material, in other words, parenting material that is not true to God's word, and by the way, I'm absolutely convinced there's a whole lot of people out there who are marketing themselves as Christian parenting experts, and I'm not going to name any names, who are marketing psychological parenting in effect. I will say this, grace-based parenting is psychological parenting. That's what it is. And I tell parents uh, all the time, Christian parents in uh, gathered in Christian churches, we need to be aware that uh, the serpent invades our community. 
with stuff like grace-based parenting, which is nothing but psychology in sheep's clothing. This is a disingenuous attempt on the part of certain people to market. All they've done is repackage secular parenting, dressed it up with a few Christian ideas, and they primarily the term grace, and market it to a Christian audience. As one Baptist pastor told me a year or so ago, he said, John, I, I went to a seminar on grace-based parenting, and I felt like I was taking Psychology 101. So anyway, the first mistake that parents make is believing the experts. The parental complaint associated with believing the experts is John, this, meaning the raising of a child or children, is often very confusing. I don't know what to do. I'm beset with anxiety, worry, concern, and guilt. And the principle is that the more you read secular parenting material or parenting material more broadly that is not faithful to God's word and God's plan for the raising of children as clearly set out in the Bible, the more confused, the more anxious, the more worried, the more concerned you will become. As I have said many, many times, the only source of parenting advice that will keep your parenting path straight, a reference to Proverbs 3, 5, 3, 6, actually, is God's word. If you depend on man's understandings when it comes to the raising of children, a reference to Proverbs 3, 5, uh, in that case, you will zigzag all over the parenting playing field and never find a coherent sense of direction. And that that's what's going on in American parenting today, folks, is people are just zigzagging all over the playing field, trying this, trying that, doing this, doing that. And, you know, in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, Paul says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. In other words, it doesn't say, fathers, don't ever upset your children. That would be ridiculous for Paul to say, based on other things that he said about children. He's not saying that. He's saying, fathers, if you don't bring your children up, according to God's word in the training and instruction of the Lord, you will exasperate your children because your children will not understand what you are trying to do and you will never be predictable. And so if you depend on man's understandings as opposed to depending on the training and instruction of the Lord in the raising of children, you will exasperate your children and you will exasperate yourselves. There is no doubt about it. So, mistake number two is wanting children to cooperate. Wanting children to cooperate. And the parental complaint that goes along with that is, John, my children won't do what I tell them to do. Right, they will not, because if you want your children to cooperate, then instead of telling them what to do, and telling them the way it's going to be, you plead, bargain, bribe, cajole, reason, explain, encourage, and promise. And when none of that works, then you get frustrated and you threaten. And when that doesn't work, then you scream and then you feel bad. And then you purge your guilt by doing something special for your child. And then you go right back to pleading, bargaining, bribing, cajoling, reasoning, explaining, encouraging, and promising, and around and around you go, and you will continue to go around and around and around until you learn how to tell your children what to do. This idea that we should be seeking cooperation from children is an example of what I call socialist parenting. It is leftist, liberal secular humanist parenting. It is socialist because it presumes 
as Thomas Gordon, the author of the best-selling parenting book of the 1970s, and his acolyte and apostle Dorothy Briggs, the author of this second best-selling parenting book of the 1960s. Gordon wrote Parent Effectiveness Training, and Briggs wrote Your Child's Self-Esteem. Both said the family should be democratic, and the parent-child relationship should be regarded as a relationship between equals. And so if you presume that the parent-child relationship is a relationship between equals, then you would seek cooperation. See, to insist that a person does what you tell him to do implies that you occupy a position of authority over that individual. And oh, no, no, no. The psychologists who began writing about parenting in the 1960s and 70s all said, oh, no, no, no. The traditional use of parental authority is damaging to a child's psyche and self-esteem. And we mustn't do that. We must regard the parent-child relationship as a relationship between equals. Parents should not tell children what to do. Oh, no, no, no. That's bad. That causes children psychic angst. And instead, we should ask children to cooperate. And, you know, today we have kids who are disobedient, disrespectful, ill-mannered, and so on and so forth as a consequence largely of this kind of drivel that came out of the mental health professions and is still coming out of the mental health professions. Let me tell you, folks, a Wall Street Journal about a month ago reviewed a book called Parent Speak by Jennifer Lear, I think her name was. And because it was reviewed in the Wall Street Journal, hey, guess what? It's going to be a bestseller. And Jennifer Lear says that one of her sources of inspiration is Thomas Gordon's Democratic Conflict Resolution Model. Oh, how sweet. So in the year 2017, we're going right back to where we started from and right back to what started all this problem in the first place. Thank you, Jennifer Lear, for um, your dedication to socialist parenting. We all appreciate it. No, uh, Lear actually said in, it says in her book that telling a child good job is in some way uh, disturbing to a child because it robs the child of autonomy and things like this. And telling a child to say thank you to Mrs. Jones for inviting you over for a play date this afternoon is all about the parent controlling the child and not respecting the child's feelings. I mean, folks, this is what caused all of this problem with child rearing in the first place. And these people, because they have no other drum to beat, they keep beating this drum. They've been beating it for 50 years, and they'll probably be beating it in the year 2067, 50 years from now. Because they have nothing else to say. Because if they said something else, they would have to say what I'm saying, which is they have given bad advice for 50 years, 52 actually, since 1965, and they are going to continue giving bad advice. And if we want to get a grip on this thing we now call parenting, we had better start understanding how people did it 60 plus years ago when children were respectful, obedient, hardworking, trustworthy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mischievous, yes, but they did not get in your face and tell you what they thought about you. So anyway, I'm John Rosemond, and you can learn more about me on my website at John Rosemond, J-O-H-N-R-O-S-E-M-O-N-D dot com. You can uh, find upcoming and spe speaking engagements there. And I'm here on American Family Radio all across the United States of America, Saturday at 5 o'clock Central, 6 o'clock Eastern, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Glad you could join us. Hope you can join us next Saturday. Bye-bye now.
This is Because I Said So, parenting advice with love and leadership from the nation's leading parenting expert, John Roseman, syndicated columnist, author, conference speaker, and the only psychologist to point out that psychology has caused more problems than it has solved. From American Family Radio, here's your host, John Roseman. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm your host, John Roseman, and the show is called Because I Said So. And by the way, people have said, uh, why do you call it Because I Said So? Well, the first reason I call it Because I Said So is because I am a guy who happens to believe that we used to know how to raise children. I am a member of the last generation of American children to be, generally speaking, raised properly. My generation failed to raise children properly. My kids' generation are, generally speaking, failing to raise children properly. This is now uh, two generations old, children being raised improperly. And I am, for those of you who are just uh, joining the show for the first time, I am a psychologist. I am licensed by the North Carolina Psychology Board. I've said this many times. I say it in every speaking venue across the United States during my travels as a public speaker. I say it in my uh, newspaper column. I say it on this radio show that I don't believe in psychology. Now, mind you now, I have a license to practice psychology issued by the North Carolina Psychology Board. I do not believe in psychology. I am not a Christian psychologist. I am a Christian who happens to hold a license to practice psychology issued by the North Carolina Psychology Board. I have nothing to do with psychology. When I counsel people, I counsel them from a biblical perspective. I do not counsel them from the perspective of bogus psychological theory. And believe me, folks, it's all bogus. So because I said so, back to that, I tend to go off on tangents. If you've not joined the show, you before you need to get used to this because this is what I do. But I always come back to where I started from. <laughs> So because I said so, I believe in the old way. I don't believe in the new way. We embraced the new way beginning in 1965, and it's been a train wreck. I don't know if you've noticed that. I believe in the old way. I believe in the way that I was raised. I believe in the way my parents were raised. I believe in the way children were raised 500 and 3,000 years ago. I believe that... We used to know how to raise children, and we need to recover that knowledge before it is lost forever, and that's my ministry in the world, and especially across the United States. I have spoken out there in the world. I've spoken in uh, Istanbul, Barcelona, Brussels, England, London, South America, Canada, the West Indies, and so on and so forth, but mostly my ministry is to parents in the United States. The purpose of the mission of my ministry is to restore traditional biblically-based parenting to America's homes. And yes, I know that's a daunting challenge, but you know, if you, if, if, if you don't take on daunting challenges, you're not going to really accomplish that much in, in, in the world. And I'm a guy who just, uh, I enjoy taking on daunting challenges. I know that single-handedly I am not going to restore traditional biblically-based parenting in all of America's households. We've gone beyond the point, believe me, where that can be done. But I still believe in the efficacy of my mission pertaining to people who will stop give my message consideration, and put it to work in their homes. I keep hearing from parents all over the country. And by the way, I take no credit for this. But I keep hearing from parents all over the country, John, it's working. It's working. It's just amazing how easy it is. Uh, right. Yeah, it is. It's easy. Uh, it's it's simple. It's, it's non-complicated. God's uh, instructions on how to raise children are non-complicated. There are five. I mean, really, and I hope I can remember them all, but here they are. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, put your marriage first. Don't be in a primary relationship with your children. Be in a primary relationship with your spouse. And the principle here is that there is nothing that causes a child a greater degree of 
security and well-being than the knowledge that his parents are in a committed relationship. Notice I didn't say perfect. I said committed. It's impossible for a marriage to be perfect. Two sinful people cannot have a perfect marriage. I, I know people sometimes say my parents had a perfect marriage. No, they didn't. You know, we have a perfect marriage. No, you don't. But, uh, you know, you have a good marriage. And your parents were good people, good God-fearing people. And that's wonderful. But nobody has a perfect marriage. But uh, nothing gives a child a greater sense of security and well-being than the knowledge that his parents are in a committed relationship. They love one another. And they demonstrate that love to one another in front of their children on a daily basis. See, here's my contention, folks, while we're on the subject, and I always am on the subject, and that is that if you are married first and a parent second, your children will entertain themselves. They won't interrupt your conversations. They'll go off and do their own thing. They'll solve most of their own problems. They won't ask for a whole lot of attention. Uh, why are so many children so stressful to their parents? Because their parents are parents first and married somewhere way back there, second, third, or fourth. I don't know what uh, the priority is, but they're parents first. Their mom and dad first, and their husband and wife second. And under those circumstances, by the way, when you are mom, you are by definition paying attention to your child. When you are dad, you are by definition paying attention to and doing things for your child. And under those circumstances, children come to feel entitled to your attention and your doing and under those circumstances, children become demanding, petulant, whining, and just generally stressful to live with. Uh, you want your children to not be stressful? Be married first. Be husband, wife first. And uh, mom and dad, a distant second. And the, you know, I know this sounds revolutionary, folks. It is from the perspective of today's parenting culture. But believe me, this is the way I was raised. My parents were not highly involved with me. In fact, it was my job to keep them from getting involved. And how did I keep them from getting involved? I did the right thing. I uh, accepted responsibility for my own behavior, chores I had been assigned, I did my schoolwork properly and on time. I played fair on the playground. Not that I always did this, but that's how I kept them from getting involved with me. And today's parents are involved. They're involved already. There is no requirement under those circumstances on the child. The child is uh, the beneficiary, if that's even a proper term, of a never-ending entitlement program. He's entitled to attention. He's entitled to involvement. He's entitled to things. I maintain that the typical parent-child relationship in America and dun-dun-dun-dun, get ready, sexist alert, mother-child relationship is a codependent relationship. We are normalizing codependency in the mother-child relationship in America. Um, and I, I, I hear people say this who have recovered from this, women who have recovered from this, John, it was just, I mean, you know, I heard you speak and I heard you speak about the normalization of mother child codependency. And I heard you describe it. And, and how do I describe it? It's simply a lack of boundaries. There's no physical boundary between mother and child. The child, therefore, feels that he can interrupt the mother at will, demand from her at will. And there's no emotional boundary. Whatever the child feels, the mother feels. And so the mother is physically and emotionally exhausted and thinks that the, the state of it, physical and emotional exhaustion is just uh, because she looks around and that's the way all the mothers are because we are normalizing codependency in the mother-child relationship. Uh, she looks around and that's the way all the mothers are. And so 
She just thinks, well, this is the way it is. You know, children, they're physically and emotionally exhausting. No, they're not. Codependency is physically and emotionally exhausting. If you're physically and emotionally exhausted, it's not because of your child. It's because of you. It's because uh, you are in a codependent relationship with your child, period. End of uh, end of it. Uh, th- that's just it. That's a that's a fact, unarguable fact. And I hear women all across the country. They come up to me at speaking engagements. They write me emails. I'll read you one. In fact, during the second half of the show, I'll read you one of these emails. And they say, John, I heard you talk and. I realized you were talking about me, and I resigned from the Good Mommy Club, which I talk about a lot, the Good Mommy Club, which is the uh, the sisterhood that uh, reinforces uh, the supposed uh, wonderfulness of mother-child codependency. And I resigned from the Good Mommy Club, and, and, and John, my parenting experience, I mean, it, 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 in like months, if not weeks, it turned around 180 degrees, and I'm... I'm a happy mom today. I'm not physically exhausted. I'm not emotionally exhausted. My children are a whole lot happier. They're doing their own homework. They're doing chores around the house. Uh, They obey me. They listen to me. They talk respectfully to me. The tantrums have stopped. The sibling warfare has stopped. I mean, folks, a, a lot if not all of the problems that are going on in the American family today are because mom and dad are the primary roles in the American family, and they should not be. The primary role should be husband and wife, Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. I said I'd give you all five scripture, and I will. Uh, The next one is Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, but we'll get to that uh, after this uh, break. The show is called Because I Said So. I'm John Rosemond, your host. You can find out more about me by going to my website at John Rosemond, R-O-S-E-M-O-N-D, J-O-H-N, Rosemond.com. And uh, I'm on American Family Radio every Saturday, 5 o'clock Central Time, 6 o'clock Eastern. Hey there, welcome back to the show. Glad you could stay with us. And if you're just joining us, I'm John Rosemond. I'm your host, and the show is called Because I Said So. And yeah, so there are, as I said, five scripture uh, that guide the raising of children, five relevant scripture that constitute God's parenting instructions. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, and the a man shall leave his father and mother, pause, God mandates emancipation. If your son is living in your house and he is past the age of 22, get him out of there. Men need to leave home. And the man shall, it says. Not, you know, this is a suggestion. I suggest that, uh, you know, maybe young men think about leaving their father and mother. No, no, no. Emancipation on the part of the male is mandated by God. It is part of God's plan. And he, the now emancipated male, will join with his wife. He will take her out of her relationship with her parents and bring her into a primary relationship with him, and they shall become one flesh. That's instruction number one. You should not be in a state of one flesh with your children And by the way, that does not mean, you know, uh, only the the term one flesh in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24 does not only mean carnal relations. It means to be of one mind, one purpose. It means to see things through the same set of eyes, to become one in relationship. Uh, That is the only relationship in which you should be one. You should not be of one flesh with your children, which you are, by the way, if you occupy primarily the role of mom and not wife, or you occupy primarily the role of dad and not husband. 
And by the way, that's why you're not on the same page. As husband and wife, you are one. You are on the same page. As mom and dad, you are two. You are on two different pages. Seeing things through gender-specific eyes. Uh, the second biblical instruction is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. And again, I don't have a Bible in front of me, so I'm pulling this out uh, spontaneously here. But it says, impress powerful word, these commandments upon your children at every possible opportunity as you walk down the road, get ready for bed, rise in the morning, etc., etc., etc. Impress these commandments, godly values, upon your children at every possible opportunity. Explain to your children why you are doing what you are doing and why you are not doing something else, why you are not doing what their friends' parents are doing. And explain this in terms of your values and your commitment to living a biblical life. Uh, ground your children in God's word and uh, ground your children in a biblical understanding of life, a biblical worldview from the earliest possible days. Uh, root them strongly in a biblical worldview. This is what Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 and 7 is saying. That the discipline of a child, and get this, folks, it's not so much about the child's behavior. It's about training a child to think properly. That's right. We think in America today, today's parents think because of the influence of behavior modification theory that the discipline of a child is all about behavior. But God says, God himself in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, God says, this is about training your children to think properly. This is about impressing a biblical worldview upon your children. The next scripture is found in uh, Proverbs 22, 6, have a long range plan. Train up the child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Have a long range plan. Have in the forefront of your parenting mind a vision of the adult you want your child to be when your child is an adult. And aim at that vision every single day. That's what keeps you moving in a straight line. That's in part what it means when it says, that's the parenting application of Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Depend not on your own or man's understandings. I'm adding some words here that are legitimate. I'm not twisting scripture. I'm simply amplifying the scripture. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Depend not on your own or any other man's understandings, and so on and so forth. And he will keep your path straight. There is a direct connection between that scripture and Proverbs 22, 6, where it says, train up the child in the way he should go. If you raise a child moving in a straight line, your child will move in a straight line as an adult. And the next scripture is Proverbs twenty two fifteen, A little bit further down the page, nine verses further down the page, we find foolishness is bound in the heart of the child. But the rod of discipline, which I've explained many times, does not mean a spanking. The rod is distinguished in Scripture in meaning from a rod. A rod is the way the term rod is used when it refers to a concrete object. The rod is the way the term rod is used when it's used metaphorically to refer to God's authority in our lives. And in this case, uh, the rod of discipline will drive it far from him. Foolishness is bound in the heart of the child. But the rod of discipline will drive it far from him simply means that in the discipline of our children, we should be a representation of God's authority in our lives. That is your child's first understanding of God. Your child's first understanding of God, for better or worse, is you. That's a heavy responsibility. You think you can live up to it? God's instructions concerning the rearing of children are perfect 
if we use perfect instructions, we're going to do a whole lot better job than we will if we use instructions from other sinful people. And then you go to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, which is also misunderstood. Fathers do not exasperate your children. That's what it says, right? No, it doesn't. It says, fathers do not exasperate your children instead. And the whole verse, you see, turns on the word instead or but. Bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. In other words, and I've said this before, the only set of instructions that will keep you moving in a straight line are God's instructions concerning the rearing of children. If you use any other instructions cobbled together by sinful human beings, you will zigzag all over the parenting playing field. In my books, I try to be as adhere as closely as possible in my advice, in my books, my my public presentations, my counseling, to God's instructions concerning the rearing of children. I keep saying to people, these are not my ideas. God forgive me and God help me if they are my ideas. These are God's instructions. This is the way it used to be done in America when children were raised properly. And they stop throwing tantrums and stop being disobedient by age three. Third birthdays, that was the norm 60 years ago, folks. In addition, a little aside, it was also the norm that children were properly toilet trained by the time they were 24 months of age. So uh, use God's instructions in the raising of a child, or you will exasperate your child. And as uh, the inimitable Forrest Gump said exasperation is as exasperation does. Are you an exasperated parent? Then you aren't using God's instructions. You're using instructions cobbled together by other sinful human beings. You're not trusting in the Lord with all your heart. You're depending on man's understanding. So I told you, I get these uh, letters and uh, emails and so on and so forth. And uh, I got this email from a uh, a woman somewhere in America, I'm not going to identify her and I'm not going to give any identifying information, but uh, she begins her email with, I'm sure you're bombarded with testimonies. I hope you have time for one more because I'd really like to share it with you. My chief of naval operations, Admiral John Richardson, introduced me to your writings in 2002. Well, he and his wife Dana both did. He is my other favorite, J.R., John Roseman, John Richardson. Like you, John is a common-sense, God-fearing family man, a conservative and funny to boot. In 2003, John was my husband's commanding officer. John and Dana had four well-mannered children. They were never overwhelmed, even during deployments. And uh, my husband and I had one very bratty three-year-old son, and I was constantly overwhelmed. I finally asked their secret, and they both said, John Rosemond, read him. I didn't listen. A daughter was born, and things got worse. By the time he was four years old, my son was hitting me and throwing wild tantrums when he didn't get his way. I heard you were coming to speak in Jacksonville, but instead I scheduled an appointment with a psychologist. That was a defining moment, John. Following that meeting, during which our son was diagnosed with ADHD and I was given a prescription for Ritalin, we sat in our car trying to figure out where to go from here. I tore up the prescription and in tears said, we are going to hear John Roseman. There must be another way because this is wrong. We heard you speak, read everything I could possibly read authored by you. I boxed up all the other parenting books and took them to Goodwill. I also boxed up everything that belonged to my son, kicked him out of the Garden of Eden. That's in my book, The Well-Behaved Child, folks, if you're interested. I had a handyman saw his bedroom door in half and add a lock on the outside. And with that, and the help of the doctor also in The Well-Behaved Child, my son became a new child that summer before kindergarten. His teacher said he was a model student and could not believe I'd ever had problems with him. She goes on to tell me your son is now in the Naval Academy. Thank you, John Roseman. It's all because of you. Well, really, no, it's not. But thanks anyway. I really appreciate it. That was very heartfelt. 
Folks, thanks for joining the show. Hope you can join us next week. American Family Radio, 5 o'clock Central Time, all across the country. Bye now. This is Because I Said So, parenting advice with love and leadership from the nation's leading parenting expert, John Roseman, syndicated columnist, author, conference speaker, and the only psychologist to point out that psychology has caused more problems than it has solved. From American Family Radio, here's your host, John Roseman. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, John Roseman, and the show is called Because I Said So, four words associated with a traditional parenting approach, and that's what this show is all about. I am back in the saddle again. Uh, Some three weeks ago, I think, I experienced a one-off atrial fibrillation, is what it's called. It's so hard to pronounce, they've shortened it to AFib. I'm fine now. In fact, I was fine four hours after it occurred. My blood pressure, I'm 70 years old, so this is pretty good, had returned to 120 over 70 where it's been ever since and my heart rate had dropped from 160 per minute to 62 which is pretty good for 70 years old as well anyway lest anyone out there be concerned i'm fine i i do appreciate the uh, the prayers and the, the many many people who emailed me called me came up to me at uh, speaking engagements and uh gave me advice because they too had experienced atrial fibrillations. And one fellow gave me the name of his cardiologist up in Ohio. And it's just, it's been uh, a, uh, in a sense, the whole experience was a blessing. And um, it just, the word is, it just focused for me. The fact that the Christian community in America is a a strong and thriving community. So I often begin this show by talking about the fact that I claim to be the, with a capital T, thorn in the side of the mental health professions in America, and further claim that I have been for quite some time. People in the mental health professions, generally speaking, there are some exceptions. There are Um, I am aware a growing number of people in the mental health professions who agree, uh, if not uh, completely, then probably uh, to a 90% degree with uh, what I say publicly through my syndicated newspaper column, books, this radio show, and uh, my public presentations. Unfortunately, the people in question do not have a public platform like I do. And so they go unheard and unnoticed, but they do come up to me at speaking engagements. They email me and they tell me things like, John, I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm licensed in uh, wherever, Oregon, California, and uh, just wanted you to know that um, you've got a supporter out here. I believe uh, in everything you're talking about, in the truth of it, and so on and so forth. And and I really appreciate those people. I really and really uh, true, truly do. And uh, believe me, I will continue to be the thorn in the side of the mental health professions in America until I no longer make any sense and um, someone else is going to have to tell me that that has occurred. So anyway, I have uh, in my hand here, my left hand, a letter that was written to the editors of the Valley Breeze newspaper, which is published in uh, northern Rhode Island. The editor and publisher of the Valley Breeze, um, and the Valley Breeze uh, carries my weekly parenting column and has for quite some time. The editor and publisher of the Valley Breeze, Tom Ward, is a friend of mine. And he has even supported a speaking engagement in Rhode Island. And he sent me this letter from psychologist Matthew J. Bowen, Ph.D., identifies himself as a clinical child psychologist in Providence, Rhode Island. 
And uh, here's what uh, Bowen says, and I'm going to read the letter in its entirety. So hang on for a few minutes. Uh, I'm going to interject, however, as I read the letter, my own comments. So here, here is uh, a psych- clinical child psychologist, Matthew J. Bowen, Ph.D., Dear editors, I am writing with concerns regarding your weekly column by John Rosemond. Through the use of obviously contrived letters from parents, all right, I'll stop right there. That is what is called a red herring. It is a literary device engaged in by people who cannot really argue a point. And so what they do is they create numerous distractions by way of uh, argument, in an attempt to uh, slander the character of the individual with whom they have disagreement. Just to be clear, the letters that I print through my syndicated newspaper column are not contrived. They may be edited for purposes of clarity, but they are not contrived. These are actual questions that I have received from actual flesh and blood parents from all over the country, and sometimes folks from uh, people in other countries. Anyway, Matthew J. Bowen, clinical child psychologist who uh, can't argue his points and so engages in uh, red herrings and ad hominem, it is called, Uh, writes, through the use of obviously contrived letters from parents, Rosemond asserts that psychology and mental health delivery systems are disempowering parents and destroying family values. Congratulations to you, Matthew J. Bowen, for a correct interpretation of my point of view. He goes on, the columns that you, the Valley Breeze, print and so tacitly support, ooh, repeatedly argue that children with emotional or behavioral problems will not benefit or will be harmed by professional behavioral health services. That's pretty close to be clear. There is no body of evidence that would compel the conclusion that Professional mental health services reliably improve child behavior, emotional states. Um, In fact, there is no body of evidence that would compel the conclusion that any form of psychological mental health therapy is reliably effective. None. Dr. Bowen goes on to say, Roseman acknowledges that he is out of step with mainstream psychology. Yes, I do. And medicine. Roseman acknowledges that he is out of step with mainstream psychology and medicine. <laughs> okay, so what Bowen means there is he, he is using the term medicine disingenuously. I am not out of step with legitimate medicine. I am out of step with psychiatric medicine, which I do not feel is legitimate. It is, uh, and, and there are many physicians who feel the same way, that psychiatry is a bogus form of medical practice. They have told me that uh, by and large, these people, these psychiatrists exist at the lower quarter of their gr- medical school graduating classes. And I don't mean to cast aspersions on all of them with a broad brush, but yes, it is a fact that no psychiatric medication has ever reliably outperformed a placebo in double-blind clinical trials. I have said that on this show many times. I have challenged people in the psychiatric profession to debate me on air or through email on this point And no one. And folks, I am aware that there are psychiatrists out there in the world who are listening to this program on a regular basis, and not one of them has raised one complaint about anything I have said because they don't want their names read on air. Why don't they want their names read on air? Because they cannot argue against my position with fact. They can't. 
to go on from Dr. Bowen. He has stated, Rosemond, in his columns that he is unaware of any scientific data regarding the benefits of children's mental health treatment. No, I'm not unaware of scientific data regarding the benefits. I am aware of scientific data regarding the benefits of children's mental health treatment. I am aware, for example, that no study done by a dispassionate researcher has ever verified the efficacy of any child mental health treatment. In reality, Dr. Bowen goes on to say, in reality, as opposed to Roseman's alternative facts, what what he's saying there is fake news. Uh, There is no shortage of solid scientific data regarding the efficacy of treatment for children's mental health problems. Yes, there is. (laughs) He's making this up, folks. I guarantee you. In the first place, scientific data, the very definition of scientific data uh, requires that it be collected by dispassionate, objective researchers. Dispassionate objective researchers have failed to confirm the efficacy of any psychological therapy, whether for adult or child. So notice that he does not quote any of this scientific data. He just uh, uses an argument uh, that is constructed on the basis of his authority as Matthew J. Bowen, Ph.D., clinical child psychologist, Providence, Rhode Island. It is called an argument from authority which means it is an argument without any objective data with which to support it. Despite Roseman's insistence to the contrary, there is no evidence that anxiety disorders, depression, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, autistic spectrum disorders are best treated by taking a child's cell phone away, taking the door off their bedroom, or demanding that they complete extra chores. Okay, so that is a very interesting accusation to make, and I'm going to respond to it. I'm going to read it again and respond to it when we return from this very necessary break from our host and sponsor, American Family Radio. Stay tuned. I will be right back. Welcome back to the show. The show um, this week is uh, focused on a letter that was sent to a newspaper in Rhode Island that carries my weekly newspaper column. The letter is from Matthew J. Bowen, Ph.D., clinical child psychologist, and he is, of course, complaining about the fact that the Valley Breeze carries my column. And I left off here. Despite Roseman's insistence to the contrary, there is no evidence, and he put no evidence in capital letters, that anxiety disorders, depression, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, autism spectrum disorders, etc., best treated by taking a child's cell phone away, taking the door off their bedroom, or demanding that they complete extra chores. Two things are relevant to uh, Dr. Bowen's remark here. Uh, Number one, When cell phone, smartphone technology became widespread in the hands of children and teens, child depression, child anxiety disorders, and child and teen suicide began to spike and have been spiking ever since. So to say that there is no evidence that anxiety disorders, depression, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder are best treated by taking a child's cell phone away, that that there is no evidence of that, is wholly false. Uh, I have seen many, many occasions when, I have been privy to many, many occasions when parents took children's smartphone technologies digital technologies, iPads, computers, video games away, and depression, anxiety disorders, social phobias, etc., etc., 
uh, cleared up within a matter of weeks. Of course, Dr. Bowen is loath to recognize that that is a fact because what it means is that uh, in many cases, children who are depressed, anxious, phobic, uh, and so on and so on and so forth, don't need to be seen by psychologists. They need simply to have their parents step up to the plate of authority and begin swinging the bat. So now we get down to the nitty gritty of things, which is that I threaten the mental health professions because I am telling the truth and because I am threatening their source of income, which is naive parents who think erroneously with the mental health professions are concerned that people with capital letters after their names know what they're talking about. And folks, if you're listening to the show for the first time, let me explain something very clearly. I have been licensed to practice psychology by the North Carolina Psychology Board since 1979. Indeed, they have tried to take my license away on three separate occasions because they don't like what I say. And this is reflected in Dr. Bowen's letter. He does not like what I say. And he represents the mainstream in psychology. I am a psychologist. I take every opportunity through my newspaper column, public presentations, this radio show, et cetera, to try and educate the American public, and especially America's parents, as to the dangers of exposing themselves to psychological therapies, including psychiatric medications themselves and their children. And guess what? This is very threatening to people like clinical child psychologist Matthew J. Bowen, Ph.D. of Providence, Rhode Island. You better believe it. I have seen non-compliant children come into complete compliance within days after parents take the door off their rooms. Uh, <laughs> you know, see, these are not the things that psychologists typically recommend. And so the, the, what they recommend are therapies that uh, don't work and that cause people to continue to have to come back and see them over and over and over and over again. When I give advice to parents, uh, regardless of the context, my purpose is to give advice that is good enough, effective enough, that these people will not need to come back and see me again. And that is a huge difference between John Roseman's practice of counseling and uh, the type of counseling and therapy that the overwhelming majority of psychologists and people in the mental health professions pander upon the American public. They want people to come back and see them over and over and over again. I do not. I want to have one or two conversations with people and let that be it. And, and let it be it because that's all that's needed. That's all that's necessary. Matthew J. Bowen, Ph.D., goes on to say, Roseman's description that, quote, I am old-fashioned, end quote, merely means, I'm going to paraphrase here, he is uninformed. No, Dr. Bowen, disagreeing with you, the almighty Matthew J. I. M. Bowen, uh, does not mean I am uninformed. But folks, that is an example of the depths to which these folks uh, need to uh, plunge trying to scrape some argument against me off the bottom of the ocean floor. While it is certainly Roseman's prerogative to remain uninformed, <laughs> I've been doing this for 40 years. I uh, Excuse me, but I have the largest audience of parents of anyone in this country. Uh, do you really think my career would have lasted 40 years. I have the longest running single author newspaper column in the history of American newspapers. I am the busiest public speaker in my field. Do you really think my career would have lasted this long if I was dispensing 
advice that was uninformed? The answer is, of course not. While it is certainly Roseman's prerogative to remain uninformed, the danger, yes, I'm dangerous, is that some readers will accept his uninformed one-dimensional one position as expert advice. It is not. Well, let me explain to you this, um, Dr. Bowen, that I have been doing this for over 40 years. Uh, my newspaper column has been syndicated since 1979. Matthew J. Bowen, Ph.D., clinical child psychologist of Providence, Rhode Island, goes on to say, suggesting that all, capital A, capital L, capital L, children's mental health issues result from poor parenting can only result in parents feeling guilty over their shortcomings. Well, what is he saying? That parents don't have shortcomings or that if they do, they shouldn't feel guilty about them? I mean, parents have shortcomings, right? We all have shortcomings. No one parents perfectly. So if uh, Matthew J. Bowen, clinical child psychologist, Providence, Rhode Island, is implying that parents don't have shortcomings, he is wrong. And if he is not implying that, but rather implying that parents should not feel guilty about their shortcomings, because their shortcomings could contribute significantly to the behavior problems they are having with their children, then he is wrong again. Because guilt, when you are doing something wrong, is a functional response. Next sentence in Bowen's letter, Roseman's, quote, solutions, end quote, do not empower parents to help their children. Well, I've got a stack of assessments here from the 20-odd parents who recently attended a two-day retreat with me in Dayton, Ohio, and every single one of them is a positive statement to the effect that I am empowering them to solve their children's behavior problems. Uh, yeah, that's what I do. I empower parents to solve the problems they are having with their children. Psychiatric medications do not empower parents. Therapy with a child does not empower the parent. So the person in this transaction between myself and Dr. Bowen, clinical child psychologist, Providence, Rhode Island, who is failing to empower parents because he recommends therapy with children, taking children into rooms and talking with them, which is a complete and utter waste of time, 95% of the time, and that may be a conservative estimate. And he also recommends, obviously, medicines for many of the behavior problems that uh uh, the children whose parents uh, come to him exhibit, he is not empowering parents. I am empowering parents because I am saying to parents, look, if you do this, this, and this, you will not have to see a psychologist and you will not have to give your child medication. And I know this, and I have been saying this for quite some time, and no one has ever written a letter to a newspaper or my licensing board or myself saying that uh, my advice has caused harm. And then Dr. Bowen ends with the dramatic remark to the extent that the Valley Breeze newspaper promotes such ignorance. I am ignorant. <laughs> it is complicit and responsible for human suffering. Oh, wow. What a soap opera. This guy must have uh, been in a previous life a scriptwriter for all my children or days of our lives. Anyway, yep, I am the thorn in the side of the mental health professions in America, and I will continue to be the thorn in the side of the mental health professions in America. I mean, just uh, just one little uh, interest fact of note is that uh, researchers have found that mental health professionals are generally incompetent at identi identifying people who are faking psychiatric symptoms. Now, think of the significance of that, folks, that you claiming to be a psychologist cannot identify a person who is faking a symptom. You can't fake cancer, you can't fake high cholesterol, you can't fake a heart attack. 
But yes, you can fake psychiatric symptoms. Think of the implications of that. This has been another exciting episode of Because I Said So with your host, John Rosemond, every Saturday, 6 o'clock Eastern Time, American Family Radio. God bless you all. Thank you.